Well, hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Closing Arguments. I'm Ryan Ruff, your moderator, and I'm joined, as always, by my right-hand man, Mr. Jack Razumich of Razumich & Associates. And here we are. Is truth stranger than fiction? The state of Indiana versus Richard Allen, part three here we're going to be diving into today. Boy, uh, there has been a lot that we have covered in the last two episodes surrounding this this case that has gained international attention and has, has completely blown up. And before we get knee deep into this case yet again, I want to take a moment and thank everybody that's been reaching out to our team on the production side as we've moved through the coverage of this case. You know, all the views on YouTube, all the listens on the podcasting platforms and the comments. Really appreciate everybody's interest in the show. and We're glad uh, we're able to bring, uh, you know, this wild case to you guys and dive knee deep into all these details. So I want to make sure we say a quick thank you to all you guys, our listeners and our viewers, and uh, we're going to keep the content rolling for you today. But uh, I think before we really get into it, we should probably start with an overview uh, to you know set the scene, if you will, and where we left off. And then, of course, uh, where we're going to be going in today's conversation. So with that, let's go ahead and bring out the man of the hour. Jack, good to see you today. How you doing, man? Hey, Ryan. Good to see you. Um... Yeah, you're not wrong. There was a lot of stuff that we covered in the first two episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, to to hit the high points for those of us, those of you who are joining us now, um, in the first episode of the series, we covered effectively the background of the Richard Allen case, uh, leading up to the circumstances surrounding Richard Allen's arrest. We ended with the fact that the defense team, or the defense team at the time. Uh, filed a uh, hundred and I think it was 136 page motion referred to as a Frank's brief. Uh, that was part of a motion to suppress hearing uh, where the argument was that the sheriff of, of Carroll County lied to the court on his search warrant application for Richard Allen. Mm. And that's where we left the first episode off. And I don't think that any of us expected it to explode is probably the, the, minimal phrase that i can put to it after yeah, that yeah yeah i mean um, it's been wild we've had as mentioned before we've had the attorneys uh were were compelled to leave the case then refused to leave the case um then there were issues with the supreme court stepping in um the second episode really dealt with about 75 percent of of the frank's brief it was again a very dense thing we went over kind of what the argument was from the defense, including the argument that this crime was actually committed as part of a a ritualistic cult slaying or possibly white supremacist cult slaying or possibly both. It's potentially flexible. Um, We're going to cover the final section of the Franks hearing here in a moment, which covers the argument that there were Odinis, uh, Odinism, I'm trying to remember, there was uh, someone in the comment section last night very helpfully corrected me that the proper turn is Odinists, not Odinites. Um, so we do read those things. I do. Again, thank you very much for everyone who <laughs> left messages and comments. Of course. Uh, I did read all of them. Uh, I did not respond to all of them, but I did read all of them. Uh, but we're going to cover the last section of the Frank's brief that discusses mm-hmm. the concept of Odinists in the state prison system, as well as Richard Allen's uh, current conditions. Uh, We're also going to try to get to at least some of the fallout for what happened from October 19th to the point where the Supreme Court stepped in. Just to bring everybody up to speed, time of recording, um, the two writs of mandamus that were filed, one of them has already been decided by the Supreme Court of Indiana. Uh, That one dealt with allegations that the chronological case summary, which is the organizational list of all things that are actually filed in a case, Um, was being manipulated or not maintained properly. That issue has been decided by the Supreme Court of Indiana. It's been cited as moot. Um, The second writ of mandamus, which was filed later and consolidated uh, several of the actions or concerns that the defense had, including uh, whether or not Judge Gull should be disqualified from the case, whether or not um, attorneys Baldwin and Rossi should be allowed to remain on as public defenders or if they should be allowed to to appear as private counsel. That's actually been set for hearing on uh, January 18 of 2024. So basically about a month from where we're recording right now. I want to stress that that is an incredibly rare thing. Um, Writs of mandamus are not usually set for a hearing. They're usually just ruled on by the Supreme Court. The fact that the Supreme Court has ordered um, an argument on this 
that's potentially big. Uh, it, it, is that good for Richard Allen? Is that bad for Richard Allen? That'll be one of those things that we have to discuss in the next episode. Uh, but the intent is that we will try to get through the basic trial level stuff in this episode. And then the next episode, we'll talk about the Supreme Court. Um, I don't know. Obviously, again, this is not my regular day job. Um, <laughs> I don't know that we'll actually have a decision or even the arguments from the Supreme Court by the time we film the next episode. We will, of sure. course, keep everybody in the loop as best we can on this. Of course. Um, but that's kind of that, that's kind of the really quick background of where we've mm -hmm. been and where we're going. And yeah, yeah, that's uh, well, let's, that's that. Yeah. Part. Well, let's 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 dig back into what we had, uh, you know, where we had kind of left off. And that was really that final section of the Frank's brief really surrounding this idea of Odinism that's happening within the prison system. So. Talk to us about Richard Allison's uh, custody arrangements and where where that leads us into this whole idea of Odinism in prison and, and the curveball that is this variable in this case. Sure. So on November 3rd, 2022, which is about five days after Richard Allen was charged with these murders, the sheriff of Carroll County filed a motion with the court, which was still at that point in time being overseen by Judge Junior. Judge Gull had not officially uh, been appointed the special judge yet. But what Sheriff, uh, what Sheriff Liggett um, argued was that he could not provide security or protection for Richard Allen in the Carroll County Jail. One of the things that um, a sheriff can do, the sheriffs, are, sheriffs are constitutionally mandated to maintain the county jails. And because they are constitutionally required to maintain the jails, if they believe there is a security risk to their jail, they can ask that the court transfer an inmate out of their jail into another facility, most commonly the Indiana Department of Corrections, while they're awaiting trial for a variety of security reasons. Um, and that's what ended up happening here. And Alan, Richard Allen was ended up tra being transported from the uh, Carroll County Jail to the Westville Correctional Facility, which is a state-owned Department of Corrections prison in LaPorte County, Indiana. Uh, LaPorte County, Indiana is uh, in the very, very northern part of the state. It shares a border with both Lake Michigan and Michigan State proper. So that's where they ended up moving him. Um, this is kind of a, a bit of a big thing. To, to, to let everyone who's listening know, people tend to use jail and prison as interchangeable terms. That's not actually correct. Jails are run by the county. That's where people who are awaiting trial are held. Prisons are run by the state of Indiana. That's where you go if you've actually been convicted of a crime that would send you to prison, which in Indiana would be a felony. At the Westville Correctional Facility, Richard Allen is in uh, protective segregation. That means that he is confined to a cell 23 hours out of every day. He's only allowed one, day, one hour out of every 24 out for exercise, um, religious instruction, um, eating, showering. Otherwise, he's maintained in his cell. And these cells aren't large. You know, I there may be... I think eight by eight by ten. I think is roughly the size of the cell. Mm. Um, in administrative segregation, you aren't given a a cushion or a futon, and a lot of these things. You're basically sleeping on a concrete block. You have mm. a metal toilet that has a a, a a water fountain attached to the top of it. Um, it it's some place to spend tortured. 23 hours of, of your day. Sheesh. Yeah, it, this is this is your world. If you're in this yeah. type of segregation, uh. this is this is what Richard Allen um, was has been dealing with, has been dealing mm -hmm. with uh, since uh, since November of, of 2022, almost oh, more than a year at this point, more than a year. These have been his living situations, as you can imagine. Um, that has not had a very good effect on his mental or even physical health, which is one of the things that uh, his attorneys were arguing when they were attempting to have him moved um, at at varying points in time. Um, so that's that's kind of a little bit of the background on the situation he's in. And it was made more 
unpleasant for him by the fact that if Alan's attorneys are correct, the people who are responsible for these murders actually appear to be guarding him in the concept that there appear to be there appears to be credible evidence that there are Odinists overseeing him at the Department of Corrections. Well, that sounds like a a conflict, to say the least. Just a tad. Elaborate, a, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's let's take a step back real quick, and and I'm going to tell you something I'm sure is going to just shock you to your very core. Um, prisons are hotbeds of gang activity. I, I realize right. that that is is probably absolutely astounding to everyone that's listening to this, uh, but there are a lot of, of gangs in prison. Some of them are really weird. Yeah. Um, we actually, I kid you not, we just did a deposition about a month ago um, with a an, an Indiana State trooper who worked in the state gang task force. Uh, he told me one of the newer prison gangs that have shown up in southern Indiana is is calling itself the Insane Clown Disciples. Uh, they cross the border with Indiana and Kentucky. This is the wackiness that we bring to you by subscribing and following the show, <laughs> the Insane Clown Disciples. Uh, um, so, so Alan's in prison. He's yeah. being guarded by he's being guarded by those linked to Odinism. How so? Right. The argument is that it, it, the, the dating question that really becomes kind of a key thing as far as the Allen brief is, not the Allen brief, the Frank's brief, is that on April 3rd of 2023, um, two new guards became basically the, the permanent um, guard duty detail, I suppose, for, for lack of a better way of putting it, for Richard Allen. Uh, these two individuals who were identified as being Sergeant Jones and uh, Sergeant Robinson in the Franks brief were constantly in charge of of escorting uh, Allen to any of his meetings with his attorneys or any of his meetings with his wife, anything along those lines. That by itself is a little bit unusual. It is, as someone who has been in and out of multiple jails and more than a few prisons, the likelihood of seeing the exact same guard every single day that you go to visit with a client, that's pretty unusual. They have rotations like everything else. So there's already mm-hmm. a little bit of suspicion by the fact that you've constantly got the same guys who are bringing them in. Yeah, like uh, it's fixed. A little mm-hmm. bit like it's fixed. Now, mm-hmm. where this got interesting and where we have this interesting connection is that Both Sergeant Jones and Sergeant Robinson would prominently display multiple patches on their Department of Corrections uniform uh, that seemed to signify a connection with Odinism. Uh, Hmm. The top patch specifically said, In Odin We Trust, which was displayed under their embroidered name tags on the right side of their DOC uniform. And on the left side of their uniform shirts were two patches. The lower of the two patches consisted of a partial American flag and interlocking triangles. Uh, which uh, gang activity experts with the FBI have indicated is a common symbol for those involved uh, with uh, Odinism religious practices. And above that American flag was a patch that proclaimed, I hate people. Leaving aside the fact that having non-regulation patches on your uniform is already a little bit questionable, Having prison guards wearing patches that say things like, I hate people, not really a comforting thing under the best of circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I get that the position's a a prison guard, but at the same time, uh, how is that passing uniform inspection, shall we say? But, well, well, Jack, uh, okay, I mean, that's this is interest. This is a very interesting tidbit of information. So what is Alan's attorneys? What do they do with that? Well... What they do with it, it actually led to – it took a little bit. It was a slow burn for them to get to that concept because okay. by this point in time, by the April 3rd point, um, they're already aware of the possible connection with Odinism as it relates to this crime. This has not been disclosed to any of the assorted uh, law enforcement officers in this, but it is something that is in the back of the heads of, of Baldwin and Razi. 
Um, in the Franks brief, they mentioned specifically that because law enforcement was not made aware that Baldwin and Razi were already onto this line of investigation, their suspicion is that's why these guards might have been so comfortable wearing patches like that to um, to these meetings, to these escort missions. Uh, Baldwin and Razi uh, made their claim in the Franks brief is that. In addition to these two being the only guards that ever seemed to be on any type of escort duty, another problem with them was that these guards were always nearby, preventing Alan from having any type of private conversation. Hmm. And the most concerning part about all of that is that at one point, the guards were actively recording what should have been confidential meetings between Alan and his attorneys on a handheld video camera. Oh, he wow. was legitimately standing. Their argument is that these guards were legitimately standing on the opposite side of a completely empty rec room with a handheld video camera recording Richard Allen having a consultation with his attorneys. Wow. Now, again, I recognize that prisons are not confidential. Prisons are not private no. places. You know, and in fact, we tell people all the time. They're not kidding when they say they record those telephone calls. Like if, if you've ever mm. had a loved one in jail or in prison, the very first thing it always says is this call will be monitored and recorded. That's different from meeting with your attorney. Yeah. Meeting with your attorney is a constitutional right. You are entitled to the, the attorney client confidentiality. You are entitled to not have that information recorded. Um, I'm glad to say that that did eventually stop. They made enough complaints. They eventually managed to get them to stop recording but that wasn't the end of it because they would always position alan in such a way that he was always facing the guards so he can't do anything to 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 talk privately cover his mouth anything along those lines because the guards would stop him. basically mm. the idea is that the guards are going to be sitting there potentially reading his lips yeah, yeah. and why that's disturbing and why that's connected up with this is on May 4th of 2023, during a meeting between one of the paralegals uh, that was at the time on Richard Allen's defense team, um, the paralegal claimed in an affidavit that was uh, submitted as part of all this filing that Allen was repeatedly asking him if his wife and family were okay, and at one point repeatedly mumbled that they were going to kill him. And when asked for clarification on who they were, Alan responded, the guys with the Odin patches. Now, mm. up to this point, because they were keeping it quiet, no one in, no one on Richard Allen's defense team had mentioned either directly or indirectly to Richard Allen that they were pursuing an Odinism angle. Oh. That creates an interesting set of... This is an interesting connection on this. Yeah. Um, huh. Now, the thing, the thing that you do need to understand when it comes to being incarcerated, um, whether the gang thing seems to kind of go in a, in a variety of different directions. Um, there have been allegations that guards become affiliated with the gangs um, in some situations, other times that the gangs are separate and the guards are separate. One thing that does happen is all these guys do talk to each other. So it is possible. I am not saying that these guards directly threaten Richard Allen. It is possible that if these are two of the primary people that he has connections with on a 20, on, on a 23 and one basis, mm -hmm. it is a distinct possibility that at some point in time, he would point out the patches and just ask them, Hey, what are those? And they could have told him these are Odinist, Odinist patches and explain them. And that could have been how that connection was there. So the fact that, sure, sure. The fact that Alan, who is sick, uh, both physically and mentally, is now kind of saying the guys of the Odin patches are saying they're going to kill him. I, again, it definitely starts raising that coincidence flag. Sure, sure. It hold, it's like, does it hold weight? Like, you, yeah. you, you know, that, yeah, yeah, it's, this is tricky. This is tricky. But, but the other thing regarding the idea of Odinus guarding Richard Allen in prison that is just remarkably stretching the boundaries of coincidence on this is that eventually, as we know, uh, Baldwin and Razi did spring 
the um, Odinism angle on law enforcement, um, specifically during the uh, deposition of uh, lead investigator Jerry Holman. That's when um, th- that's when Baldwin and Razi started laying their cards on the table with regards to, hey, um, we know that you didn't follow this up. We know you didn't follow this up. We know you lost this. Here's all this Odinism stuff. What do you have to say about this? One week later, um, Baldwin and Razi go back to the Westville Department of Corrections, and this time Sergeant Robinson escorts Richard Allen as usual. Um, Sergeant Jones isn't there for whatever reason. The Odin patches are gone. The Odin patches are gone. So Sure they are. So mm-hmm. the defense attorneys have a knockdown, drag out, shouting match of a deposition with one of the lead investigators on the case says, we know about this Odin connection they don't mention the Westville Correctional Facility in the deposition. They don't say anything about the guards with the patches or anything along those lines. They just basically say, mm-hmm. we're aware of this connection. Why haven't you done anything about it? And then one week later, when they visit their client in jail, the patches are missing. And Convenient. It is. It, yeah. it, you know, could it be a coincidence? Sure. But it's really starting to stretch that credibility. Sure, sure. And, and, and it didn't help that the prosecutor's office initially tried to downplay this. They eventually had to grudgingly acknowledge right, that right. That's important Jones to go back and Robinson to. Were, were affiliated with Odinism, uh, but they played up more the angle that this was religious practice as opposed to any type of gang affiliation, white supremacy affiliation. And mm-hmm. again, to be fair, it is classified as a neo-pagan religious sect. It is not necessarily a gang or a white supremacist affiliated thing. Right. But again, these coincidences just keep adding up. It's sure. weird is what I'm saying. <laughs> so so l- let me ask you this, though, Jack, to, to kind of like play devil's advocate for a moment. If we flip the coin and we look back at Richard Allen, there is one big thing that's kind of too important to not acknowledge. And that is Richard Allen did have a confession at some point in time. So. So while, yes, we've got all these coincidences adding up over here in Alan's favor and his defense's favor, what say you to the confession? Because, I mean, look, that's a pretty big element at play going on here. What do you have to say to that? The confession is definitely the strongest post-arrest evidence that the state has. Um after being transferred to the Westville Correctional Facility, um, Alan did make uh, telephone calls to both his mother and his wife, uh, where it is alleged that he admitted to killing the girls. That's a pretty big thing. Very. There is a difference, and, and we may or may not have alluded to this way back in the first episode. If I didn't, we'll do this now. There's a difference when it comes to confessions between the admissibility of a confession and the weight to be given to that confession. It's the same as any other evidence. Admissibility simply means that the appropriate um, boxes have been checked to consider it to be legally permitted to put this, uh, this evidence before a jury. Juries can determine what weight they want to give to this evidence. So, for example... A confession that meets the legal standard of admissibility. It is voluntary in the concept that it hasn't been physically beaten out of a, a, a suspect. That represents the concept of a legally admissible confession. Um, but if the investigator is in the interrogation room lying or implying things that aren't true or says, you know, you just tell us what we want to know, we'll take you out for ice cream. You know, now that comes down to the issue of like, is it a reliable confession? And when it comes to Richard Allen's confession, the argument from the defense is that the confession isn't reliable because, again, he's potentially being guarded by the very people who may have been responsible for these murders. After realizing that the guards at the Westville Department of Corrections facility that were guarding Richard Allen were in some way, shape or form involved in Odinism. 
And uh, if this isn't a great example for why you should set your uh, Facebook page to private instead of public, this is a great example because uh, the attorneys, uh, Baldwin and Razi, went and looked at the public Facebook pages uh, for both uh, Jones and Robinson um, covered in covered in, in we love Odin Odinism mm. situations. Uh, they were not in any way, shape, or form hiding their affiliation yeah. or interest in this. Yeah, they attempted to move him for his own sake. Mm -hmm. um, they attempted to move him by requesting a uh, hearing on April fifth, twenty twenty three. So again, this is two days after they realized these guards are wearing Odin patches. They file a motion with the court that says, um, hey, so we really like him moved to another facility. He seems to be deteriorating. His health is bad. Um, we really want him out of there. Uh, Judge Gull, who's on the case by this point in time, denies it without a hearing. Um, they file a motion to reconsider on May 3rd. This, is eventually, this eventually leads to a hearing on June 15th. Uh, where the warden, among other people, are brought down to court to testify about this. Um, effectively, they investigated themselves and found that they did no wrong. So uh, Judge Gold denies the motion to transfer him, orders him still held at the Westville Correctional Facility uh, mm -hmm. on July 19th of 2023. Where this becomes an issue with regards to the confession is if Alan is being guarded by the people who may have something to do with this murder and they tell him if you don't admit to killing these girls we'll kill you or we'll kill your family that could lead to him basically absolutely getting on a line that he knows is recorded and admitting hey um i killed those girls mm -hmm. you know could have so influenced that, that that yeah yeah very much so because of the influence concept exactly right so right that's that's kind of where the confession argument is. It doesn't mm -hmm. argue that the confession is not legally admissible, although there is certainly a strong argument sure. that could be made sure. that it's the product of duress. Um, but you're not going to be able to find any hard evidence of that. Sure. Uh, well, the, well the let's. Are, yeah. 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 Let's let's double click into this for just a moment, because. OK, so if it was, a, you know, an Odinistic killing. Why Richard Allen? You know, what, what, what's his involvement? Was he just wrong place, wrong time kind of guy? You know, what, why him here? That's the $65,000. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah. The probable cause affidavit, as has been mentioned in previous episodes and by other commentators, is ridiculously sparse on details. Mm -hmm. um, Shocking. <laughs> the probable cause affidavit makes it seem like suddenly out of the ether from absolutely nowhere, um, the face of Richard Allen appeared to Sheriff Liggett, um, and he knew that he had the right guy, and they just built the case based off of that without actually explaining anything about the hows or the whys on that. Um, the probable cause affidavit does make reference to the testimony of the eyewitnesses or the people who claim to have seen uh, bridge guy and provided the FBI and Indiana state police sketches. Um, but again, as was argued in the Frank's brief proper, the representations of what they identified are, perhaps stretched is is the polite way of phrasing it um yeah so i don't i don't know i don't i yeah. don't know why richard allen i don't know why they chose him well maybe I time will know. tell yeah, <laughs> but maybe, but maybe. Uh, it's it's it is really up in the air as to as to why him specifically but i figured i i needed to ask it just to, if there was a if there was really a, a long play going on here but Jack, let, let's let's kind of shift gears now. Let's move into this idea of like the fallout of the case and and where it is we see things moving from this moment forward. But um, I'll let you set the scene on this this theme because I know it's, it's a big one that we want to cover in today's episode, which will likely tee us up for for a, a you know a fourth and final conversation around this case. But well, I mean nothing's final until the of course a verdict comes down. But Correct. um, 
But yeah, set the scene for us on the fallout of this case in general and what it is we can we should keep our eyes on. A couple things real quick before we do move on. Uh, there were two more okay. things I wanted to get into with regards to the jail. Uh, one's, one's another one of those really creepy coincidence type things. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, um, the concept of the gang sometimes involving guards or sometimes not involving guards really hit home in a rather awkward way back on July 7th of 2021. On July 7th of 2021, FBI Special Agent Gregory Frenzy who, if you'll recall from our last episode, was one of the three in law enforcement officers that was initially investigating the concept of a connection between Odinism and the murders of Abby and Libby, uh, was himself shot and killed in the line of duty at the uh, field office in Terre Haute, Indiana. The person who was arrested and charged with his murder is an individual by the name of Shane Meehan. Shane Meehan has previously been a guard in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So again, mm. is it a coincidence? It absolutely could be. But again, like you get so many <sighs> there's those coincidences, a lot of coincidences. That stacking up. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a, lot, a lot, of lot of coincidences going on here, man. Jeez. Yeah. The Ooh. final thing with regards to the prison situation, we did allude to this at the at the top of the episode. Um, Richard Allen eventually did get moved. Um Part of part of the argument, one of the things that happened in in this situation is at the same time that uh, Baldwin and Razi filed their Frank's motion on uh, September 18 of 2023, they filed another motion for immediate uh, and emergency transfer of custody, um, arguing effectively. All the same stuff they argued previously, but now with the extra additions of the issues, like here is the other stuff that we couldn't talk about before. Uh, that played a key role in one of Judge Gull's arguments with regards to um, why she eventually wanted to force the two of them off the case, which we will start moving into here in a moment. Um, which made it interesting that they did eventually move, uh, move Allen. Uh, back on December 7th of uh, this year, so just a couple weeks ago, the uh, Department of Corrections, through the Attorney General of Indiana, notified the court that they were moving uh, Rozzy, not Rozzy, they were moving uh, Allen from the um, Westville Correctional Facility to the Wabash Valley uh, Correctional Facility, which is in Sullivan, Indiana. Um, that itself was a little bit unusual um normally there does need to be a notice there does need to be a hearing that's attached to it that says hey we want to move him out of this facility and this is why um for the doc to basically just step in and say hey uh we're moving him what are you going to do about it does stuff like that happen sure but again this is a high enough profile case that these things Really, at this point in time, everyone should know not to do these things without crossing your T's and dotting your I's. It's going to be examined by somebody. Of course. It also heavily undercuts one of Judge Gull's arguments for why, Brad, for why uh, Baldwin and Rosalie needed to be removed from the case, which is they mm -hmm. were making demonstrably false claims about the Department of Corrections because, you know, lo and behold, uh, the DOC basically says, like, ah, we're moving them. Mm -hmm. We're not really giving you a good reason for it, but we are moving them. So, you know... Has his condition improved in Wabash Correctional? Probably hard for it to have gotten worse, to be perfectly honest. Sure, but sure. I, uh, I have not heard any updates on his condition since moving down there. With regards to the fallout, um, as you can imagine, this was an ex this. If there was interest in the case before, there was. Uh, twi you know, 10 times as much interest after um, the Frank's motion got filed. Again, as we talked about before, um, you know, Frank's motion is basically tossing a live grenade into a courtroom. You have accused a law enforcement officer of deliberately lying to a judge. You can't walk something like that back. No, no. And you add in the concept that they presented a theory of the case that we've spent now two and a half episodes going over. <laughs> right. Um, 
clearly there's enough that's, to talk about there. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds <laughs> yeah. like it was out of like a Hollywood writer's room. Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, all of a sudden that was that was huge interest. And they knew what they were doing. They definitely took control of the narrative back because when they filed their motion on uh, September 18, they file it at like two o'clock in the morning. Um, Indiana, Indiana has an electronic filing system. Um, the exact time right down to the second that something is filed gets recorded by the electronic machine. Uh, when it gets there, even if the court is closed and does not see it until the next business day by filing it, um, electronically, like it creates the timestamp and says, this is when this was filed. This is how we're playing with this. So they filed their motion at two in the morning because that gave the greatest amount of lead time between the clerks effectively kicking their computer on first thing in the morning and someone being able to grab this. And this is what everyone's been talking about since. This is effectively how we got this initially. Um, Redditors or other people online who were uh, paying very close attention in this case saw that this motion had been filed, saw the supporting brief, and by hook or by crook, um, I'm not entirely sure how Reddit does anything, and I'm probably happier that way, uh, someone grabbed the, the Frank's brief, and it was all over the internet at that point in time. And that's what really regained control of the narrative on this. And as you can imagine, this did not sit well with Judge Gull. Oh, of course um, not. Of course not. Having the opportunity for all of that to be out yeah. for the public consumption until they could shut it down. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they did try to shut it down pretty quickly. The, oh, the I can imagine. In, the courts <laughs> yeah. in Indiana open at eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot tell you exactly when this was processed. I know that by 930, it was already removed from the publicly available docket. Okay. They were moving uh, quick. <laughs> yeah, they they move quick once they realize what was going on. Uh huh. It doesn't, yeah. Doesn't yeah. take long for the internet to grab something and run with it. Sure. Uh, so sure. They shut it down pretty quickly. One of the main reasons that Judge Gull was so angry is prior to this, after Baldwin and Rossi had um, accepted the appointment as public defenders on this case, Judge Gull issued a gag order, and and part of the purpose of the gag order was to prevent extrajudicial statements attempts at um, kind of trying the case in the media, tainting the jury pool, things of that nature. Um, I'd like to point out that in my own personal opinion, I think the gag order was ridiculous. Um, the state asked for a gag order after they had had something like three or four press conferences, including a press conference where the superintendent of the Indiana State Police was crying on camera saying, we got him. Um, Baldwin and Rossi's press release was basically a very straightforward, hey, um, they've got the wrong guy. The evidence doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. They have arrested the wrong person. We look forward to proving that. Like, that was enough for them to say, okay, okay, no more talking to the press, anybody on this one. So by allowing what was at the time a publicly available pleading to be grabbed and then disseminated around the internet, uh, which meant around the world at that point in time, Judge Gull's opinion was that they were violating the gag order, perhaps not directly, but violating it in spirit. They were again going back to the concept of, um, you know, we have done something that guaranteed press coverage, public talking about it. We've made it harder for you to get an impartial jury, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So she was already not happy about that. Everything came to a head, though, on October 19th of uh, 2023. That's, that's basically um, the next big date of note with regards to this case. Prior to October 19th of 2023, there were a couple of incidents that popped up uh, that had already had Baldwin and Rossi on Judge Gull's um, you know, no Christmas card list. <laughs> the first was the first was something that was kind of inadvertent. 
Um, at one point in time, uh, Baldwin was attempting to email something about the case to uh, Rozzy, um, started typing in, uh, you know, Rozzy's first name, which is Brad. Um, the autofill on the email grabbed another attorney's name or another person's name whose who's initial start, whose name started with B-R-A. And he accidentally sent, and and Baldwin accidentally sent a summary of items they were looking at or trying to organize to this other attorney. Not exactly the crime of the century on this. Like it, it has happened. Yes. Um, this, this I don't happens. think that there's a single person on this planet that has not accidentally sent a text message incorrectly, sent an email incorrectly. Almost all attorney email signature bars specifically say this is intended for this recipient. If you're not this recipient, you know, we're sorry, please delete this. It is a thing that happens. We literally got a text message this morning from someone who wanted to know what time dinner was. Uh, wasn't from one of our clients. I assure you that one. <laughs> um, but you know, it stuff happens. Like that happens. Yeah, stuff it's like human that nature. It's human nature. You know, fat but thumbs. They were, <laughs> yeah, but they were, you know, th that eventually becomes one of those things that Judge Gull and Prosecutor McLeland make this big deal about how they're mm. not they competently hold on to safeguarding it. the evidence, safeguarding oh, the, the information. The worst thing that happens, though, is that sometime in they're not entirely sure on this, but sometime in either late August um, or early September, an individual by the name of Mitchell Westerman, who was at the time uh, a friend of attorney Baldwin's, effectively betrayed all bounds of friendship and stole crime scene photos out Whoa. of Baldwin's office. Mm. Um, Mm, not cool. Again, Oof. remember these crime scene photos, you know, one of the things that one of the things that really kind of made the Frank's motion or, or the Frank's brief kind of really have a little bit like eh, maybe this could have happened this way was the fact that they were able to tie um, that uh, Brad Holder had pictures on his Facebook that rather closely mimicked the crime scene photos that hadn't been seen by anyone by this point in time. Mm -hmm. Um. That's still true, by the way. That that part of the argument is not in any way, shape, or form changed by this. The, yeah. the you know the Holder Facebook posts were well, well before this. Um, but Baldwin's office in Franklin, Indiana, was kind of the command center, for lack of a better way of putting it, for where they were um, housing the materials. Kind of, they would have it laid out. Um, Westerman at one point in time had rented space from Baldwin. He had a working relationship. Uh, Baldwin thought that he was a friend. At some point in time when Baldwin was not looking, Rozzy went, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, Westerman went into this conference room and started taking photos of the crime scene photos on his own phone. Mm. This is obviously without Baldwin's knowledge, without Baldwin's permission. Um, Mitch Westerman actually was charged with that theft fairly recently. The uh, Johnson County Prosecutor's Office requested the appointment of a special prosecutor, uh, Prosecutor Lindsey K. Holden from Columbus, uh, from Bartholomew County, uh, filed charges of conversion, which is uh, basically your low lowest level theft offense in Indiana. It's, it's an A misdemeanor. But he was charged with stealing this property. Even though he didn't physically remove it, he just took the photos of it when he was not allowed to do that. That's mm -hmm. enough to justify the filing of this. Uh, and that just happened recently. But Mitch Westerman takes these photographs. And then what he does is he provides these photographs to an individual by the name of Robert Fortson. Robert Fortson is easily one of the more tragic people that are attached to this case because Fortson takes those photographs and then he sells them to a podcaster mm. down in Texas. And the podcaster puts those up. I believe at this point in time, they have been removed. Uh, I can't guarantee that I'm trying to track down some of that was a little bit more difficult. As yeah. Far as once it's, it, once it's up though, uh, you know, correct. It is. Once it's up, if someone was able to grab it, knows. much like the Frank's brief, 
it's out there. People can find it. They really, really try hard enough, I suppose. Yep. Fortson eventually, eventually when it became apparent, because Judge Gull, of course, went absolutely ballistic once it became known that these crime scene photos were in the possession of a podcaster down in Texas. Like there's only a handful of places these could have come from. And even though we probably shouldn't give the law enforcement officers the benefit of the doubt right now, given some of the other shenanigans that have gone on, um, they got the benefit of the doubt from the court <laughs> and it didn't come from them. And to his credit, uh, Westerman did admit and fess up to Baldwin that, hey, I'm responsible for this. I did this. He was able to explain who he gave the photos to, where things went from there. Um, the Indiana State Police attempted to interview Robert Fortson on October 10th of 2023. Um, he refused to answer any questions without an attorney present, which is his absolute right. It's also the number one thing that all of us tell our clients to do. Do not answer questions without an attorney. That's not what the tragic part about all of this is. Uh, the tragic part about all of this is believing that he was in more trouble than he probably would have actually been in and believing that he was in far, far over his head about this. Uh, Robert Fortson did ultimately take his own life that evening, mm. uh, leaving behind a wife and a daughter. Oh, it's awful. Um, that information was communicated to the court. There was a multi-party email chain discussing what to do or what not to do next. Mm -hmm. um, Prosecutor McLeland was arguing that Baldwin and Rossi should be disqualified for incompetence. The argument being that on two separate occasions, they allowed confidential material to be released to someone who was not authorized to have it. The first one being the uh, incident with the uh, accidental email address. Yep, the fat fingers. Um, yeah. The fat fingers. And the second one being the fact that crime scene photos were stolen out of Rosie, out of Baldwin's office. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, is it their fault? Uh, you know. Oh, so that's tough. So what ends up happening is, is during this process, you know, this is this is at the this is at the end of September. This this is like I said, this is about October 10th. We're about we're a little over a week away from uh, from the big hearing on the 19th. Judge Gall takes the extremely unusual step of telling both Baldwin and Rozzi stop working on this case right now until we have an opportunity to talk about this on the 19th. At this point in time, she's already kind of indicating that she is leaning towards disqualification. That's when uh, Rozzi, uh, no, it wasn't Rozzi, when, uh, when Baldwin hired uh, Dave Hennessy. Dave Hennessy is another attorney here in the Indianapolis metro area. Uh, Hennessy was hired for the purposes of effectively acting as the attorney's attorney to argue why disqualification was a both unwarranted and excessive as far as a possible sanction for all of us. The next thing that happens with regards to this, that kind of, again, did sort of probably should have raised flags. Um, Indiana, a couple of years ago, had a pilot program of cameras in the courtroom. Um, the success or lack of success is in the eye of the beholder type of situation like that. Um, but it is permitted at this point in time that the press can request of the judge that they want to be present in the courtroom with cameras. There are restrictions on this, of course. There are certain hearings that absolutely are not eligible to have cameras in there. Uh, you can't photograph any jurors. Um, multiple requests have been made to Judge Gull to have cameras there. All of a sudden, now on October 19th, Judge Gull says, yeah, we can have cameras in the courtroom. So the 19th rolls around, Baldwin, Rozzi, McLeland, uh, Hennessy, I don't know if there were anyone else, any others back there, are all called back to judges' chambers for what's referred to as an in-camera hearing. An in-camera hearing is part of the court record. It is, it, it's a type of hearing where 
you would review medical records outside the presence of any jurors or any other parties that might not be authorized to see them uh, prior to their admissibility. It's a type of situation where a judge talks with a young child and say a divorce situation as to whether or not they're going to be allowed to testify uh, in, in an action with their parents. Um, but it is technically part of the record. There is a court reporter. There was a court reporter there that day. And what happens is Judge Gull basically tells Baldwin and Rozzi, here are your options. This is my prepared statement that I intend to read to the press. You can either voluntarily withdraw from this case, mm -hmm. or I will go out there in front of national television, I will read this statement, and then I will have you removed from the case. Talk mm. about a Sophie's Choice situation. Yeah, that man, brutal, brutal for, brutal for those two. I mean, in the in the amount of effort and time and energy that's gone into this case for it to come to this. I mean, well, and oh. it gets it gets worse in the grand scheme of things too because they're not being given any significant opportunity to determine what their options are. It, it right. is, it no, is it's, it's quite literally a take it or leave it situation. Very much. Um, so. They don't have much of an opportunity to have a meaningful consultation with, with Richard Allen, uh, who was transported. He was not taken back to judges' chambers. There were security concerns with that for obvious reasons. Um, but they have to kind of rapidly have this very fast meeting with him about- A very big happening. meeting. Exactly. I, I mean- and, and what ended up happening at that point in time is Baldwin and Rozzi did agree to withdraw from the case at that time because in their opinion it would have been detrimental to Richard Allen's defense for them to remain on the case uh, or no not to remain on the case let me strike that let me back that up for a second it would have been detrimental for Judge Gull to go on national television dress his attorneys down and uh, then order them off of the case mm-hmm that took some control of the narrative back because what ended up happening is again remember the the, the Frank's brief gets filed back on September uh, September 18. Uh, we're now at October 19. So there's been a full month of people talking about the arguments that Baldwin and Rozzi had made. Um, Baldwin and Rozzi withdrawing from the case had an immediate effect by causing a good chunk of the public to say, "It's like, oh yeah, they're just they're rats deserting a sinking ship." They knew this was a bunk argument. They knew this was going to be something that they would just not really get. They, it wasn't going anywhere, so they decided to get out while the getting was good. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that started – for someone who was so concerned about trying this case in the media, she certain, you know, Judge Gull, in my opinion, certainly did a lot of things that made this look like she was trying to, again, um, influence public perception on how that process went. Agreed. And meanwhile, the prosecution's just like, you know, they're grinning ear to ear over this whole thing. Oh, of course. I mean, of course, yeah, of course. I just... So what, what happened with that is um, neither when, – when, when the actual hearing happened on the 19th, because and this is all happening back in judges' chambers. It's recorded. It is part of the official record. But this is all happening back in chambers. When the judge goes out to address – the courtroom, uh, Baldwin and Rozzi don't go out with her. In chambers, Baldwin orally moves to withdraw based off of Judge Gull putting him in the position of doing that. Um, Rozzi says, I will file something formal here in the next couple of days, but he does not make an actual formal motion to withdraw at that point in time. Um, and they're summarily dismissed by the court. Uh, Judge Gold goes out. They bring Richard Allen in with all of his uh, entourage of uh, police officers who were guarding and transporting him. Prosecutors out there. Judge Gold tells the press, um, you know, something beyond our control has happened. The attorneys have asked to withdraw from the case. I've allowed it. Um, we'll come back on October 1st. Um, you know, to, sorry, on uh, November, uh, on October 31st, uh, for the purposes of addressing what we do with regards to representation from here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, leave my courtroom. For the record, 
she did not allow attorneys to come back on October 31st. They asked. There were no cameras that are going to be allowed there, which again fuels suspicion that the cameras were there specifically for the purposes of creating additional pressure on Baldwin and Rossi to voluntar- voluntarily withdraw from the case. Yeah. A few days later um, is, is where the fireworks really start happening from there. On October 25th, attorney Rossi, who still officially has not withdrawn, like he did not make the oral motion in the court, he's not formally filed anything, files two rather important motions. The first is he files, which referred to as a notice to the court, a verified notice of continuing representation, where he basically tells the judge, not to her face, it's in writing, but effectively to her face, you were wrong, you exceeded your authority, and I'm staying on this case, and what are you going to do about it? Wow. The other wow. thing that he does is he files a motion to disqualify the judge. Now, mm. if, you thought, if you thought that <laughs> accusing the sheriff of the county of lying to the court was a grenade in the courtroom... Accusing a judge of being biased and incapable of being impartial, that's setting off an entire nuclear arsenal. Oh, wow. Yeah. These guys are, these guys you are better never be right. going to be on Judge Gull's Christmas card list. Let me put it no, that way. No, never, never, never. There will be no gifts coming right. down the chimney. Uh, among, oh, other, among things that, that, um, that, that, that Rossi argued, um, he argued that Judge Gull violated, doo, 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 doo. Judge Gull violated rules uh, 1.2, 2.2, 2.3, 2.6, 2.8, and 2.11 of the Indiana Code of Judicial Conduct, all of which describe the concept of fairness and impartiality towards the attorneys, towards the parties. Uh, the argument was that Judge Gull was displaying clear bias against the, the defense. Uh, defense by arguing that uh, she had uh, manipulated the, the chronological case summary and hiding pleadings to make it look like things weren't happening when they actually had happened. Um, that she issued the gag order after a relatively milquetoast middle of the road. Hey, our client is innocent, um, which gave them absolutely no real ability to push back against the multiple press conferences the state had had by that point in time. Um, effectively backing them into a corner and ordering them that if you don't withdraw from this case, I will humiliate you on national television. Um that's that's effectively what it was. You know, they they, mm-hmm. they put that in there. Um, now here's here's what you need to know about judges. <laughs> Tread carefully, Jack. <laughs> yeah, they don't. They, thanks. They they <laughs> don't like having. They don't like being called out like that. Of course not. And to her credit, Judge Gull took probably the most professional approach to the situation that she could which was to effectively say we know that the you know the court knows that this has been filed however um this is no longer the attorney on the case um therefore we're not doing anything basically you know basically the response back is like what's that is someone talking i don't hear anyone because there's no one on this case so we've now got a major tit for tat going between the judges oh yeah Oh, yeah. Between the judge and the attorney, mm-hmm. which comes to a bigger head on Halloween. <laughs> Great night for it. <laughs> One of the things that that is argued um, that will be argued with regards to the writ of mandamus, um, as well as in uh, Baldwin and Rossi's motions to stay on the case, is that Richard Allen has the right to the counsel of his choosing. That is technically correct there are some there are there are a handful of exceptions to this there are rules that do kind of cover those things but generally speaking you are allowed the attorney of your choice if you can afford them you are not inherently entitled to a specific public defender 
So the plan that Baldwin and Rossi had was to file what are referred to as pro bono appearances. Pro bono is basically free. They're alleging, hey, we're entering into this case as private attorneys. You don't have to pay us. Richard Allen wants us on this case. We're back, baby. That went over like a lead balloon. Of course. Um, they showed up by this by this point in time. Richard Allen's uh, new public defenders had been appointed to represent him. Uh, Judge Gull grabbed two public defenders from Allen County, which is where her courtroom is out of, in, uh, you know, per permanently. Again, she's a special judge on this case, so she mm -hmm. grabs two of her public defenders assigns them to the case. So on, on someone October on home 30th, turf, someone on yeah. home turf. So, mm -hmm. you know, the court starts and, you know, Richard Allen's got four attorneys lined up, two were appointed by the court, two filed pro bono appearances. Uh, again, Judge Gull's not happy about this. No, of course and not. And Judge Gull effectively says, I find um, Andrew Baldwin and Bradley Rossi to be incompetent and I will not allow them to represent you no matter how much you want. That is technically one of the things that a judge can do to disqualify someone. If a judge finds that a particular attorney is not competent or not qualified to represent a particular type of situation, uh, the judge can disqualify. Them. So, for example, if you hired someone who is literally fresh out of law school to represent you on a death penalty case, even if you hired that person and paid the money, the court still has the authority to step in and say, this guy's been an attorney for like two weeks. You're not doing a death penalty case. That is something mm. that the court does have the ability to do. And that's what they were, that's what Judge Gold decided to do in this situation. Is she just from the bench said, I find these two attorneys to be incompetent and unqualified, and they are not allowed to represent. And then the Supreme Court stepped in. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, oh boy. You know, we'll, we'll definitely get to that on the next concept. Yeah. I, the, yeah. The, the original action. The first original action regarding the CCS had already been filed by this point in time. The second original action was filed after this. That's the one that dealt with whether or not the court had the authority to throw them off if the court acted improperly and should be allowed to remain on the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the one that's set for hearing on January 18. Um, yeah. And so, so here we are. I mean, we're talking about a date that's a month, month out from when we're sitting down to record this, Jack. Obviously, I mean, it's, there's been fireworks at every twist and turn of this case from the, you know, from the original crime itself to the, you know, the Odinism that's, you know, that variable that's come into play to the, the, you know, the cracks in the prosecution's case to the way the judges hand. I mean, there has just been a lot. That's a lot to digest. Hence why we're, it's taken us four episodes to get into, you know, what will now be a fourth episode to get into it. But man, man, just a lot to unpack. So, uh, you know, why don't you know, kind of my final summation question then to you, Jack, is if, if you were to set the scene on what we're going to tackle here in our, our fourth and final episode, or at least I, I keep saying that word final, but you know, nothing's final until we truly reach a verdict on the, you know, the state of Indiana. Yeah, versus say, I think, Allen, you're, but... think you're being ambitious on the concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe final. I am. Um, yeah, this is not an episode of Law and Order. I got to keep reminding myself that even though it sometimes feels like it. Dep uh, like, de depending on depending on what the Supreme Court ultimately decides, we there might be I, I, I anticipate the next episode will probably discuss what the original actions were, what the mm -hmm. issues of the court was looking at and the maneuvering with that. Um, to set the stage for the argument, I, we do have a full trial calendar next month. We will try to film as quickly as we're able to, uh, while taking into account our fiduciary responsibilities, people that we are helping right now. Of course. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to film before the court hears oral arguments. I can virtually guarantee that the next episode will be done before the court issues an order. So... Mm -hmm. At best, we'll be able to kind of describe what the original action is, um, anything that's happened between now and the next episode, because, you know, God knows, you know, who knows, someone could walk into the courtroom tomorrow and say, this is the knife that I used to kill them. And that would not in any way, shape or form surprise me at this point. In time. Yeah, at this point, no. <laughs> uh, well, man, well, Jack, I, I appreciate you diving knee deep, really waist deep at this point into the details of this case, this convoluted case that is the state of Indiana versus Richard Allen. And uh, uh, looking forward to being back on the next with next one with you and, and really unpacking the Supreme Court's role in all this. 
Jack, appreciate you and your time. And and look, folks, we want to take one final moment and say thank you all to to our our listeners and our viewers and all the interest that you guys have poured into the show, especially as we've covered, uh, you know, this case. It, boy, just a you know a roller coaster of a case and details and emotions, just so much to go through. And uh, so we appreciate the interest and the feedback and all the comments. It's great, and uh, we're excited to hear more from you guys as we put out part three here. Uh, but look, you know, for Jack. I'm Ryan. We're going to go ahead and say so long, but again, we appreciate everybody stopping by and being with us on today's episode of Closing Arguments. We'll see you on the next one.